Hey everyone, it's Imran from Options Insight with your Macro Options Daily. Okay, um, so Spot took a bit of a stock, sorry, took a bit of a breather yesterday. Um, S&P not doing a whole lot. And we got PCE inflation data came in softer than expected. Uh, ISM manufacturing data disappointed, uh, printed 49. Um, that's in contractionary territory, obviously below 50, but it came in worse than expectations as well. Uh, bad news has been good news lately, uh, if you look at how markets have generally reacted. Uh, but the reaction to non-farm payrolls, which is due out in 11 minutes, is going to be key uh, to see if that dynamic between bad news is good news continues. Um, a lot of people thinking that your, the whisper number is um, going to come in lower there, right? We've seen, we've seen job cuts and stuff in the tech industry. Uh, some of the leading indicators that we're seeing from other surveys are suggesting that that we are seeing um, reduction in employment. Uh, is that going to feed through to non-farms this time round? Who knows? There's obviously a lot of seasonal adjustments and things like that that happen in this number. So I think there's going to be a lot of noise around it. Uh, but let's see how markets react. Um, outside of that, metals ripping higher. Uh, obviously, China's been relaxing COVID restrictions. Um, metals, especially industrial metals, tend to like that. So silver and copper have been rallying pretty strongly. Uh, but gold's been flying as well, and gold really testing that 1800 level right now, which has been a big resistance zone. If it can break above that, then who knows how far this thing can run. Um, vols got hit in equities um, as the rally fizzled out. Uh, so we've been saying that, you know, vol vols had held up. Uh, VIX had kind of held up quite well on that big up 3 to 4% day. Uh, and that's because um, when when these when these moves accelerate through around two percent, often the the dealers need to scramble and pick up whatever gamma they can, uh, and they did that, and that kind of held vol the day before. But then as markets stabilise and don't continue with that rally, uh, then we see vols come down, and you can see here all these vols coming down, half a vol to a vol point across U.S. and European indices. Commodity vols were a bit of a mixed bag, except nat gas, which continues to get hammered. So nat gas down five vols again. That's down 23 and a half vols on the week. I mean, it's pretty spectacular, the move. Obviously, we've been saying it was a short. Seems to have worked out quite well. It's still at 98 implied vol, though, right? And it's realizing 57. So there's a 40% implied uh, carry there. Um, so potentially, you know, when would I consider covering my shorts? If this got into the 80s again, right, 80 to 85 vol, and it was realizing 50, then I'd probably consider buying it back and closing that position out. But for now, given that it's got a 40% positive carry, I don't feel in a massive rush to do that. And it certainly feels as the spot trend has kind of, you know, calmed down. It's down 11% on the week now. It had had a massive monster 50% rally off the lows, but that trend seems to have calmed. So no, no reason to do a lot with that trade right now. Um, and then in terms of skew, uh, we are seeing... Generally, skew still low. You can see here on these lower percentile ranks in equities. Um, gold skew getting hit, though, as the upside break uh, looks like it might happen uh, on the lower yields. Uh, silver skew, on the other hand, has bounced um, sharply. Um, and that's because, obviously, silver's had a 6% up move in the last week. And anyone who wants to protect their silver exposures, uh, it's an opportune moment to do so. So that, that's kind of why you're seeing silver skew catching a little bit of a bid for the puts there. All right, now the dollar got absolutely hammered yesterday uh, on the back of <clears throat> obviously the data that came out. Huge move down. Um, dollar, you're seeing euro up at 105, cable up one and a half. So you're seeing a good sort of one and a half to two sigma moves in the major FXs. Dollar yen down 2.2 sigma as well. So dollar yen continuing to slide lower. TLTs, so the long end bond was up 3%. That's a 2.3 sigma move, huge move on TLTs. So you're seeing yields come across, come down, but they're coming down across the curve. Even the two year yield getting absolutely whacked yesterday. Um, now, well, why is that happening? I mean, clearly the deceleration in the US economy is becoming evident through the ISM data, through the Chicago PMI in the 30s. Um, so these are things that are spooking the market, and this is why bonds are catching a bit of a bid. Um, if you look at ARC, if you look across the sectors, ARC continued to climb, uh, not in the same magnitude as the day before, which was nearly 8%, obviously. Um, that was a big short squeeze, but continuing to climb um, as, as that long in duration catches a bid, basically. And then those stocks tend to move in a similar fashion. Um, FX vols generally softer. You're seeing half a vol down moves across euro, sterling, Swiss, things like that. Uh, dollar yen was up. And um, dollar czar was up quite heavy as well. Uh, but some political shenanigans going on there uh, in, in South Africa. So that's kind of driving that 
it's a bit idiosyncratic that stuff but in general vols drifting lower despite some pretty big um you know one and a half to two sigma moves on the day across the fx space carry has flipped back to negative as you can see across most fx um we were saying that we didn't think this positive carry would last very long in fx land and that seems to have been proven to be correct um, and we do think non-farm payrolls today is probably going to continue to bring some moves uh, although there may be some time once we digest whatever the whatever the move is today on non-farms, um, there may be some scope for calm next week um, as, as you don't have any big. The material data points are really going to be CPI, FOMC, which don't happen until the week after. And you also happen to have OPEX that week on the 16th. So that's going to be a big week, uh, the week of OPEX. Uh, but next week, we might have a chance of having a little bit of relative calm, uh, depending on what this non-farm print does and if it doesn't kind of catalyze a big move in either direction. Um, and then lastly, SKU, not a lot going on in FX SKU again, except for Dollar Czar, which has its own sort of idiosyncratic stuff going on with politics. Um, that does seem to be unwinding a little bit overnight. Dollar Czar kind of uh, moving back the other way, 2%. Um, it looks like the, the the current sort of leader's got a bit of support, a bit more backing, um, and that's helped. Uh, but if we look at TLT SKU, it's still at zero. That had flattened recently. Uh, we had said the market was... Often you see these shifts in skew and it tends to kind of lead a move. And that certainly proved to be the case in TLT because as that skew flattened dramatically, um, TLT has just continued to gap to the upside, right? And it's at 106 now. That's that's a pretty big move off the lows. I think it, the lows were pretty much down at 90 and that's TLT having about a 15% move off the lows, which is pretty um, impressive for, for the long bond there. Um, and then lastly, looking across sectors, we see XLV skew a bit lower, uh, looking quite cheap now, as does ARC, ARC skew uh, in the lower percentiles there as well, along with XLV. Uh, ARC vol, on the other hand, is still at 50. Uh, so that might put off some buyers. Uh, just the absolute levels of 50 vol don't look as extremely cheap. But if you look at the carry, it is realizing 54. So, so maybe it's still reasonable value there at 50. Okay, that's the that's the vol summary. Um if we, if we look at what, what I'm seeing, um, macro vol dominate. So, so here we're just talking about some, some uh, data that's been analyzed by Barclays. Uh, they're basically saying that, you know, macro vol, which is what they're calling rates vol pretty much, hasn't traded this far above equity vol, um, except for in the stagflationary period of the 1970s, right? So the idea being that we're seeing consistently higher vol in rates than we are in equities, uh, and that tends to happen in stagflationary periods, right? So that that's they're just kind of explaining what is the driver? Is it equity vol or is it rates vol right now? Clearly, it's rates vol. Um, now, my my personal thoughts are that I don't think inflation has been tamed just yet. Yes, it looks like it's peaked, but it, but we still need for it to come down quite a long way. Uh, we've got a potential China reopening happening sort of in the spring that could take commodity prices higher again. Um, and then, so that would drive inflation and that would drive rate volatility. Uh, and then we've got both DXY and 10 year yields at major, major support levels. Uh, 10 year yield back to three and a half percent. DXY parked at around 104. These are huge levels um, and they're not levels where I just expect the market to die and do nothing, right? So we could see some pretty big swings off these levels. And so I think macro vol isn't about to go away anytime soon. So I would be continue to be a buyer of dips across cross asset volatility. And I would use any seasonally quiet periods like we just had or like Christmas in a few weeks um, to maybe pick up hedges and accumulate hedges because I don't think Q1 next year is going to be a quiet one. OK, uh, and then obviously non-farm payrolls is a big data point today. Um, everyone's going to be looking for evidence of a slowdown uh, in the job market. Um, and, and what's going on with wage pressures, which give us a read on how persistent inflation will be um, and see if that's going to make it easier for the Fed to slow down tightening. Uh, recent price action has indicated that the whisper is probably for a weak jobs number. Um, but whilst bad data has been met with higher stocks up till now, uh, this dynamic is going to potentially be tested if the unemployment numbers are too poor. Uh, and we'll see if the market starts to to care more about growth and um, just the state of the economy uh, rather than the idea that the Fed is going to pivot sooner because rates have already priced in a bit of, um, you know, easing from the ultimate hawkishness. How 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 much further are rates going to come down given that we, we haven't seen the inflation data come down anywhere near as much as we need it to? So that's kind of all the stuff that's going to be driving things. Um, what are we looking at outside of uh, non-farms and stuff? 
Well, HYG um, is, is an asset that I obviously keep a close eye on. It's part of my role dashboard. Um, it's been rallying on, alongside risk assets and is testing key downside resistance up here at 75 and a half. Um, I do remain bearish in general. Um, I do think, you know, it's going to be difficult for credit markets to go materially higher in the face of a deteriorating economy and in the face of QT still ongoing. Um, you know, this asset as well feels a little bit less squeezy than things like NASDAQ, S&P, uh, when markets do rally. Um, and the Treasury strength that we've seen recently is on the back of recession probabilities rising and not on expectation of monetary policy support. Right. So the idea there being, um, you know, HYG isn't going to necessarily rally that hard in the face of we're going into a recession. Right. If it was a case of, yep, yeah, we're going to we're going to we're going to stop QT, we're going to start QE again. And it's all monetary policy is completely reversing engines. Then maybe HYG can rally off that. But I don't think we're there yet. Right. That's something that might happen next year. But I just don't think we're there yet. So I do think the downside is still uh, all to play for in HYG. Um, now, we have seen some flows in the market last week. Uh, we did see February 23 and June 23, 75 strike puts getting bought uh, in decent clips. Uh, people spending multiple millions of dollars of premium in those options. So some reasonable bearish expression of views, uh, taking advantage of the cheaper volatility levels as the vault has been coming down in HYG. If we go to our dashboard, you can see implied vol is down to around 11. Um, so it's, yeah, and, and we're kind of seeing bearish risk reversals um, being sort of flagged as the trade here. But I actually... I've got a slight variation on that trade um, for what I want to do. Uh, but you can see here the term structure, pretty flat, around 11 vol. Um, you can see implied vols peaked near 20. Uh, they've come all the way back down to 11. So looking pretty decent in terms of implied vols as an entry point. Spots obviously up there near the top of the Bollinger Bands. And you've got um, skew at the low end of the range, right? So you can see here, three months skew in the yellow is kind of down to levels it was in April. So we do think owning some downside in HYG is starting to look quite attractive at these levels. Now, would I do a straight risk reversal? Probably not, just because implied vol levels are quite low. And so just selling naked calls on the upside when vols at 11 doesn't feel great. And if you don't own the underlying asset, I'm not long HYG in my long term portfolio, then that would be that wouldn't be a covered sale. That would be a naked sale of a call at an implied vol of 11. That doesn't really sit very well with me. So the way I would kind of um, slightly tweak the bearish risk reversal expression is by doing. That. And then on the last page of our of our week of our daily, uh, we just look at some volatility, volatility relative value opportunities. This is just some of the pages from our weekly uh, vol dashboard that we produce for subscribers, where we kind of have various screens where we compare multiple assets in one place to try and see where the relative value is, right? And, and the sort of things that are jumping out are that TLT vol here is above S&P vol. Uh, that doesn't really tend to happen very often. So you would probably expect that gap to close. Um, HYG volatility down here at 11 is actually coming in at equal to or even less than a lot of these FX rates. That's quite unusual for HYG vol to be trading underneath FX vol. So again, why we like picking up some HYG vol via the structure that we described in our trade idea. And then if you look across the sector strategy compass, you can see that everything's looking relatively low. That's why the crosses are below the flat line. Um, so fairly low to mid range volatility. But the thing that really stands out is here XLV, where spot is very stretched to the upside. Uh, vol is relatively cheap, and and you can't see on here, but the skew in HY in H, in XLV is in the lower percentiles as well. So buying outright puts in the healthcare sector, that's what XLV is, looks pretty cheap right now uh, as a way of just hedging general macro risk. If you think the equity market is due a sell-off, then these puts are looking very very cheap. And and the truth is, if we get a broad macro sell-off where correlations rise. A lot of people are parked out in healthcare names because they're defensive stocks. So at some point, once people have rotated into the more defensive parts of the market, when broader market sells off, the stuff they need to dump is the stuff that they own, which tends to be things like XLV. And that may be a good opportunity to get yourself some puts on board because they're priced pretty cheaply. All right, that's it for today. Um, and that's it for the week. Have a good weekend. Uh, look out for our uh, macro weekly uh, and I'll catch you all next week. Thanks.